Hey everyone, it's Colt. Welcome to day two of the course. Uh, if you're brand new, make sure you go back and watch day one first. Each day, each video builds upon the previous. And today we are picking up right where we left off. We're continuing with HTML. So we're gonna cover some of the more advanced elements, things like video and audio, iframes, how we embed content from places like YouTube. We'll also cover some less exciting, but equally or probably more important elements like spans and divs, and then some oddballs, subs and soups, super text, subtext, and horizontal rules. And just like yesterday, there will be a homework assignment at the end. So a couple of things to get out of the way up front. I know it's a little bit annoying. First of all, while we're on the topic of homework, yesterday there was a homework assignment. If you're looking for a solution uh, that you want to compare your code to, or if you need to reference a solution, if you had any questions, the download for today's lesson or today's lecture, there's a single link in the description. It includes the code that I type throughout this video. It includes the homework assignment for today and it includes the solution from yesterday's homework. So there are two folders in there, today's homework and then yesterday's homework. In there, you can see my solution for this big cat's exercise. All right, and the second thing um, is an ask on my end. If you enjoyed the video yesterday or if you are enjoying the one today, or if you just want to stay up to date, consider subscribing. Um, you'll see all the future videos. And you know, you can always unsubscribe at any point. It's just a single click away. And so is subscribing. So, you know, just a click. And more importantly, if you're enjoying the videos, please consider sharing them uh, with any of your friends, family, coworkers, especially if you know anyone who's cooped up at home like I am, anybody who might want to learn something new for free at home. Um, things are crazy, obviously. On that note, I hope everybody is doing well. If you're locked up uh, like I am or out in the world, free as a bird, hope you're all doing well. Crazy times. All right, with that out of the way, let's get started. So we're going to begin with two elements that may not seem that useful at the moment. They are called span and div. They are useful though once we talk about styling, um, but we need to cover them now just because you'll probably see them and they're worth talking about. So I'm on MDN, uh, the website I showed yesterday. I'm looking at the element reference for span. You can find all the elements here on the element reference page um, and then find span or what I usually do is just Google search. I'm sure that's what I did. If we go, yep, Google search MDN span. That's how I find things. So what is a span? Well, according to MDN, it is a generic inline container for phrasing content, which does not inherently represent anything. Okay. So let's start with this first part inline. Yesterday, we talked about the difference between inline elements and block elements. Block elements force themselves onto their own line. Inline elements can get along, they can fit between other elements, they fit in line. So a span is an inline element, unlike say an H1, which is a block level element. So I'm gonna make a new file, I've actually already done it. I've named this one index.html, and the only reason I named it that is that it's very common to see. You can name your file whatever you want, but I figured it would be good to introduce this, this common name, index.html. It's a name that's commonly used for the main page of your website. If you have multiple pages, you've got one main page or just the entry point into your website, but you do not have to name anything index.html. So I'm gonna make my little skeleton here. And usually, as I mentioned yesterday, I just type exclamation point and hit tab. But let's go through this, see if I can remember doc type. I'm, I rely on that crutch too much. Uh, I can never remember where the exclamation point goes here or if it's here, but it is right there. So instead of using that crutch, the autocomplete, let's go through the basics. We need our HTML. We need a head element, which should have a title. And I'll just call my page more elements. And then I'll add in my body, which is where all of the content goes. And let's begin with a H1. So we saw this yesterday. I'll just go with more elements. This will be the main heading on our page. I'm going to refresh my page in the browser where I've opened this. Remember, you can double click your file, drag it to the browser. You can do a file open and find your HTML file. And I'm gonna show you something just very quickly. We have not talked about these developer tools, so don't worry about it. Um, but what I'd like for you to see is that when I hover over this H1 with these Chrome developer tools, you can see that the H1 goes all the way across the line. That's because it's a block level element. Now, if we add in a paragraph of text, um, I'm gonna use another little shortcut coming from VS Code. If I type lorem, 
L-O-R-E-M and hit tab, it will expand into, I think it's 50 characters or 50 uh, words. I'm not sure how many words, but some number of words of lorem ipsum text, which is just common placeholder. So it doesn't mean anything, but it just gives me some text. So there's a paragraph. <laughs> Google wants to try and translate it. No, thank you. And if we look at that paragraph with the same developer tools, again, you don't need to do this. You can see it goes all the way across as well. But if I put something in like uh, below this H1, an anchor tag, and I'll just give it some random href equals, just make something up. It doesn't matter. I'm not going to click it. I'll refresh. No translate. If we look at that anchor tag there, it does not go all the way across. I could have two anchor tags in a row, or three of them, refresh my page, they all line up. An anchor tag is an inline element, like this diagram here. Paragraphs, H1s, those are two examples of block level elements. So a span, which is how we got here, we're talking about spans. Spans are generic inline containers. They will not do anything. You won't see a span unless you alter its styles later on. So if I put a span somewhere in here, I'll just go with I am a span and I'll wrap that in a span, put the closing tag after I am a span. If I save and refresh my page, we see I am a span. It is not on its own line, it is in line. Nothing looks remotely different about it, but it is now wrapped in a, a span element, which is something I can go back later and target using CSS. I can apply different styles. Um, so for example, if I wanted to have bold text or italicized text, we have elements for that. But what if I wanted to make one piece of text a color or a different font size within a paragraph or even within an H1? If I wanted the first letter to be much larger or a different font or a different color, I need to have some way of targeting one letter or a couple words. So spans are one option for doing that. Spans are just a generic wrapper that you can put around some content. They are in line. And on MDN, the example they use, is making ingredients in a recipe red. But essentially with CSS, you target things based off of their element type. So you could target paragraphs and make them red, but that would make all of this text red. With a span or multiple spans, there's one for each ingredient, we can get much more specific about what we're making red. But we haven't gotten to that yet. So for now, a span is not going to seem all that useful. The second element is kind of similar. It's called a div stands for a division element, which I always forget. I always think divider, division. It doesn't matter what it stands for uh, because it's another generic container. It's a generic container, but it is not in line. It does not inherently represent anything. It is instead used to group content so we can style it later. So as an example, here is an image and a paragraph. And if I want both of them to be grouped together so I could put a border around them or background color, I know it's not very pretty, once we get to CSS, we need something to hook onto, something to add a border to. So we could just add a border to an image or to the text, but if I want them to be grouped, I can use a div. So it's not going to be anything that we can really see or look at right now, but we'll add a div in. So back in my HTML, if I wanted to, I don't know, let's say I have two paragraphs. So I'll make another paragraph with more lorem ipsum text. I could wrap both of them in a div and close it after that paragraph. Now I just have a generic container wrapped around those two elements. I'll refresh. Yes, we have our second paragraph showing up, but we don't see any evidence of a div there. doesn't seem like anything happened and nothing really did happen. There is a new element, but we're not styling that div in any way. And those two elements are now out of the way. They're very similar in their, their goals. The main difference is that a span should be used for pieces of text. Um, a div should be used to group content. It's also generic, but it's used to group content so that you can later apply styles or do something for multiple elements at once. All right, so now that we have those two out of the way, we're gonna move on to some slightly more exciting elements. Now I did only say slightly more exciting. The first element we'll take a look at is called the soup or superscript element. It's how we specify that some piece of text should be displayed as superscript. And as you can see here, it's for solely typographical reasons. Superscripts are usually rendered with a raised baseline using smaller text like that right there, where we've got the exponent a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So we've got superscript, superscript, superscript. If all you want is to make text smaller, 
you should never use superscript. That is not the idea. We will learn with CSS how we can change the font size of any text. It doesn't matter what sort of element it is. Superscript should be reserved for cases where you actually have valid superscript text, something that should be raised above the baseline of the font of, or the rest of the text. So exponents, um, citations, or footnotes sometimes. I'm sure there are other things. I guess copyright symbols would be an example. Anytime you need some small text that is raised off the baseline that is supposed to be superscript. So the element name is, or the tag name is SUP for superscript. Um, why don't we, in order to make this more visible, I'll do an H2 and I'll start with A2 plus B2 equals C2 without any superscript. There we go. Now I'm going to add in a superscript SUP element around that first two. Save. I refresh the page and now that two is superscript. So we can do that same thing. Um, one thing I'll show you is that in VS Code, if you hold Option and you click, you can spawn multiple cursors. So I don't want that many. Um, I'll go back. And right before right before the 2 of B2 and then right before the 2 of C2, I can click and have two cursors, type my SUP, and then hit the arrow key to the right. And now I can close that SUP. I don't have to type it twice. Okay, refresh the page. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So along with superscript, we also have subscript. The tag name is SUB. Subscript is text that is displayed below the baseline of your text. So uh, I'm trying to think of examples. <laughs> um, in this case, a, a molecule. So writing down um, chemistry formulas, I guess. I'm sure there are some other examples. Do they have anything else? Footnotes. If you want to put a footnote number like that, mathematical stuff using variables, X1, XN, chemical formulas, probably not all that common, not something you really need to know, at least not up front, but while we're here, might as well be comprehensive. So let's do H2O, no subscript, and then come back and add our SUB element around that too. SUB, close that correctly with that tag slash sub, save and refresh our page. Okay, so that's superscript, subscript, pretty straightforward. Now we're actually going to see something a bit more exciting, HTML video elements. So the video element is how we can embed video content on a page. We also have an audio element. We'll start with video. There are quite a few attributes that we could cover. We won't go over every single one, uh, but we'll go over the basics. So the element name to add video to a page is just video. We need an opening and a closing video tag. And then we need to specify where the video is or what resource should be played here. Just like with an image, we had to set a image and then give it a source attribute, SRC, and set that to, I don't know, flower.jpg or something. Same idea, but with a video, we want some video content. And I've actually gone and downloaded some free stock footage um, from this website, Pexels. If you have video at home you wanted to use, um, if you had you know, a, a promo video you wanted to put on your website, or uh, you'll often see something like this if you, right here. This header is actually video. We don't have controls. I can't change it. It's just in the background. There's no audio. That's pretty common in a lot of uh, newer websites where there's a big video in the background um, just to give some visual interest. You obviously don't want something important in the background. Uh, it's just sort of to add atmosphere or to make, I don't know, to improve the design, apparently. So you can download free videos, uh, wh whatever the video is, it doesn't really matter. Let's just take one of these, this one here, free download. Um, okay, so it's downloading, you can see it there. And then I'm going to put it in the same folder where my index.html file is. Here it is, it's called mountains.mp4, or I renamed it to that, name it whatever you want. Take note of that extension. Most videos that you download these days will be MP4, but there are other video formats. And then as long as it's in the same folder, um, it's very easy to reference. Like we saw with images, you have to have the correct path to find that. So on a video, we also have a source attribute and I'm gonna set it to mountains.mp4. If I had it in a, a subfolder like video slash mountains.mp4, that would work if I had a video folder with mountains inside of it but I'll just put it in the same directory. All right, so I'm gonna save. This video is quite large and you'll see that here. It takes up a lot of space. 
it's also not playing and I don't have a button to play it. I'm clicking, I'm double clicking, I'm hitting enter. It's not working. It's just looking like a big image. So before we see how to play a video and how to add controls in, um, we will resize it. Usually the way you would resize something is via CSS, but we haven't covered that. So there is another option. If we go back to MDN, on any element that you look at on this website, developer.mozilla.org, there is a list of attributes. So we'll see source on here. They're alphabet, uh, alphabetized. Here we go. Source, the URL of the video to embed. Then the one I want to highlight is width. Width is how we can set the width of the video's display area. We haven't talked about CSS. Generally, you don't want to set a width in your HTML, but we can, and it will make it a little bit more workable for us. So width equals, it's an attribute. We need quotes and an equal sign. And then it's actually expecting a pixels value. CSS pixels we have not talked about, but if we do 400 PX, whatever that number is, PX, that will set the width. So 400 pixels wide is what I'm specifying. There's also a height, height, not height. Refresh, now we have a much smaller video. Maybe we could do 800, at least on my browser, my uh, computer screen, 800 is, that's manageable. Now we need to talk about how we get this video to play. So there's a couple options. One is to set an attribute on there called autoplay. If specified, the video automatically begins to play back as soon as it uh, can do so without stopping to finish loading the data. There is a note here, sites that automatically play audio or videos that have an audio track can be an unpleasant experience for users and should be avoided when possible. You've probably had that experience. I remember when I was uh, trying to adopt my first dog in New York, Rusty, rest in peace, Rusty. Um, I went to a, a shelter's website. It was a little shelter run by this one woman, very sweet woman. Um, and her, her website played the most obnoxious audio every time on loop, very sad song. And, uh, what is it in the arms of angels? Um, something, I think that's what it was. Anyway, you just immediately reach for mute. It's horrible, especially when websites don't give you the option to mute it. So you have to just turn your volume off. And if you were listening to music or you're doing something else, that's pretty frustrating. So we don't want to autoplay something if there is audio, that's always annoying, but to autoplay something, in this case, there, I don't think there's audio on this. It's just a stock video. We can add the attribute autoplay. Now, autoplay is actually the first example of an attribute that works a little different than what we've seen. We don't need to specify a value. So we don't need an equal sign. We don't need quotes. We don't need something inside. Instead of saying autoplay equals yes or true, all we do is just specify autoplay. If this is present, it will autoplay. If it's not there at all, it won't. So let's add that back, save, we refresh, and hmm, still doesn't work. Well, this is a little quirk of Chrome. Um, depending on the browser you run this in, if I copy that URL and I move to Safari, you'll see it plays just fine. But Chrome in particular is extra stringent about autoplaying videos. This is um, one of the things you'll learn uh, about browsers and writing code for the browser in general. There are differences. Certain browsers have different rules or they might expect something or they might be even missing a newer feature. Once we get to JavaScript and CSS, that's pretty common. So this note says in some browsers, for example, Chrome 70 and above, autoplay doesn't work if no muted attribute is present. And muted is just an attribute that we can specify on a video. Scroll down, we can find it here. Where are you? A Boolean attribute that indicates the default setting of the audio, blah, blah, blah. By default, it's false, meaning that audio will be played, but we can silence any audio by setting muted to be true, which it's another one of these attributes. It's called a Boolean attribute. We don't need an equal sign or anything. We just put muted there. Now we won't really notice a difference in terms of sound because this is a silent video anyway, but if you did have audio, it would be muted. And I'll refresh my page now in Chrome and it plays. We've got our autoplay. Another thing we can do is set controls on the video. It's a attribute that we need to specify called controls. It's also just a Boolean yes or no attribute. And this allows a user to control the video or not. So you just specify controls. I will refresh again. Now I have those familiar controls where I can play and pause. I can fast forward. I can decide if it's muted or not. I can full screen. That is all thanks to that one attribute controls. 
Other things that you can do include um, specifying that the video should loop. So if we want the video to repeat, if we get to the very end here, oh, I accidentally hit full screen, but if I just seek forward to the very end, it just stops. If I add loop as another yes or no Boolean attribute, it's either present or it's not. If it's present and I refresh, it auto plays, I have controls, and it repeats, it loops until I stop it. The last thing that I'll show is that you can specify a poster. So if you don't have autoplay, I'll get rid of that. I think it just defaults to the very first frame as what you see, but you can change that if you wanted to have a, a thumbnail or some sort of image there. Um, you can just set a poster attribute, show it to you here. And this is an attribute where we need to specify a URL for an image. So I'll just, uh, I have one on my clipboard here, this URL. So I'm going to set poster equals and paste that in. If I refresh, there's the poster, this bunny. And then if we hit play, it goes to our actual video. So if you don't have those controls, then it's going to be hard for a user to play. You'll just be displaying that poster image. Um, one other thing is that this can get a little bit cluttered. So you can format these however you'd like. If you would prefer to do this, totally valid. It's a little bit longer, but it's also potentially easier to read. Next up, we have a pretty similar element, the audio element, which is used to embed sound content in a HTML document. So yes, you could just have some music playing on your web page um, if you wanted to make a 90s-ish web page. Totally fine, although kind of frowned upon if it auto plays and, you, and the user can't turn it off. That's horribly frustrating, as we've discussed. But most of the time, I'd say it's not that common to have audio just available on a web page um, unless you're doing things like making a game, a JavaScript game. You want a soundtrack. Maybe you're doing uh, a slideshow. Maybe you have a web store, you're selling MP3 tracks, um, and you want a free preview. Those could all be done with audio elements. So while we're talking about video, might as well talk about audio. It's basically the same format. So audio is the name of the element. And then we have our source attribute. So I actually have a little piece of audio I made um, a couple nights ago on my iPad. I was locked in the house and um, bored and my internet was not working. So I played around with the GarageBand app on the iPad and I called this iPad song dot m4a which is the file type let's see what happens if i just load that up if i refresh the page we won't see anything different and we also won't hear anything for the same reason uh, that we discussed with video chrome at least newer versions of chrome um, are not going to autoplay anything unless you can guarantee that it's muted in the case of a video i don't know if that would even work in audio if you could specify that it's muted it kind of defeats the whole purpose at least with video you still have video to look at but if we add in controls, which just like the video element uh, is going to specify that we want to have controls available for this audio element, we now have these controls here. These controls are implemented by the browser, so they will look different depending on the browser you're in. I didn't do any of this. I just said make me an audio element with controls. Now let's see if it works. There we go. So we've got the standard controls. Uh, we can change the volume. We can play and pause. Pretty straightforward stuff. And I think that's enough for audio. Um, there are obviously other attributes, other things that you can do with audio. Uh, there are things like um, specifying if the audio should loop, you can make it muted at the beginning, but overall it's relatively straightforward. Next up, we've got a very curious but potentially obnoxious element called an iframe. It stands for inline frame. It's basically a way of nesting or embedding a document, so a separate web page inside of your current web page. So this can be useful to do things like including maps. Um, if in this example, this is an open street map web page, it exists on its own. If you visited that URL, you would see a full screen map. We are embedding it here. 
So it can be useful, um, but they are also kind of obnoxious, and I'll go into why. Uh, but let me just show you how it works. We need to set up an iframe element, so iframe. And just like with an image or a video or an audio element, we have a source attribute. But this source attribute is going to be a web page, not a MP4 file or a JPEG or something. It's a web page. So I'm going to use this Wikipedia entry. These are the moths that I have been raising. And uh, I'm just going to put that right there inside of source. I'm going to save, refresh my page, and we see a very tiny little web page that's embedded in my own web page. It looks awful. Um, but it is Wikipedia there. It's just hard to navigate. And a site like Wikipedia is probably not something you would ever embed anyway, but you can. Um, it's just not great, right? It's kind of a bad experience for a user. Also, in terms of accessibility, it's horrendous. Uh, if a user is using a screen reader, they're coming across each line, trying to understand what things are, and then all of a sudden, the content just jumps to completely, potentially unrelated content, new structure. There's a nav bar here. There's a sidebar. There's a logo. Um, that, there's probably a header in here, and that could be very confusing. If there's a header on your main page, then all of a sudden, another header. So usually, what you want to do is specify the title attribute, which we can read about here. There you go. Specify a title that includes information uh, like something page, Wikipedia page, or embedded map, something that's clear um, as to what somebody is browsing if they can't see it. So we'll go with Wikipedia page on moths. I think they're Cecropia moths. Okay. Then we can also set a width and a height. So Again, something you often would do with CSS, but I could make this a bit larger. How about uh, 400 pixels wide? Let's see how that looks. And then for the height, I don't know. Let's just do a square. Oof, so ugly. I'm going to get rid of this anyway. Um, it's important to note, though, that you cannot just embed any old web page. If I try to do, I don't know, google.com or something, www.google.com. A lot of web pages are going to prohibit, they're not going to allow uh, themselves to be embedded in another document. And a lot of the time that is done uh, because iframes sometimes are the source of, um, or they can be a weak point in a web page. There are security issues if, if you don't know what you're doing. So my recommendation is to pretty much avoid iframes as much as possible, especially writing your own. Um, but with that said, there are certain times where iframes can be very nice. You've, you may have seen this before. If you try and embed a YouTube video, if I go to YouTube, here's yesterday's video. If I click share and then embed, it gives me this little thing to copy right here. And if you look closely, it's an iframe. Now it has some other stuff we haven't talked about, um, but I'll copy that or just click the copy button and paste that in my HTML document. And I'm basically embedding a web page. But if I went to this web page, Let's try visiting it now. It's just the full screen video. So we're embedding this. This allows us to get the standard sort of YouTube player instead of just a single video file. Um, also, YouTube can track who's watching what. They can recommend new videos after you finish. You know, they can put their ads in there. So there are other applications, other websites that have embeddable content. You can embed tweets using iframes. You can embed uh, Spotify previews, um, Vimeo videos. So it's not like you should never, ever use an iframe. It's just that I try and avoid them. I don't like teaching them um, because they seem cool. They seem powerful. But unless you are embedding content from a web page um, like YouTube or Vimeo or Spotify, I would avoid using them. Don't just add some arbitrary page like Wikipedia as an embedded page inside of another document. Just not a good, not a good idea. Anyway, here's my video. It's showing up. If we do take a closer look, you'll see there's a lot of stuff in here, like allow accelerometer. Um, this is for mobile phones so that you can uh, rotate your phone and, and get full screen. Autoplay is set in here. Gyroscope or gyroscope picture in picture. Let's not worry about it. Just know that there is an iframe element. Avoid it unless you're copying an iframe from a big application like YouTube or Facebook or something. Another very quick topic is comments. In HTML and in most programming languages, markup languages, basically in our case, in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, we have access to comments in a file, in an HTML file in this case, 
which allow us to write something that will not be run as HTML. They allow us to write notes. Basically, they'll be ignored by the browser. So if I wanted to add a little note here about what an iframe is, in HTML, the syntax for the comment is really annoying. I never remember it. But if you're in VS Code, there's a shortcut. Hold Command and then forward slash. I believe it's Control forward slash if you're on a PC. Um, or if the shortcut doesn't work, you can type this. I just never remember uh, the order of that exclamation point. It's kind of annoying. When we get to JavaScript, you'll see that our comments are way shorter. If you ever work in Python or Ruby, comments are even shorter. HTML comments are obnoxious, um, but they allow you to write things in here. For example, you know, don't use iframes. This will not show up on the page. You won't see that when I refresh. That note is completely ignored. So it's just a way of adding a note to yourself. And if you're using VS Code, um, you can toggle them on or off on a line. So sometimes I use a comment if I don't want to delete something, but let's say I'm trying to debug or I'm not sure if I want something to be present. If I'm not sure if I want this video, I could select it. And instead of deleting the whole thing, I can just comment it out with that shortcut, command forward slash save. It's still there so I can change my mind and then I can go back and command Z and decide that I want it. It's just an alternative to deleting. So one last, and I mean it very quick element that I'll show you uh, is called an HR. It looks like this. And honestly, it's not that useful most of the time. It stands for horizontal rule. It will make a line going across the screen by default. If you don't style it, it looks like that. We can easily create our own lines and dividers once we get to CSS and we can we don't even need an element. We can add a, a bottom border, for example, to this H1. We can change the color, the width, dotted line, give it all sorts of different fancy effects when you hover. But for now, we don't have CSS. So if you want to divide things, we can use an HR. It does not have a closing tag. You will see it both with the self-closing slash at the end. It still works or without it. Either one is fine. Um, and again, not very common in the real world, common in older websites, but it just gives us another element to work with for now. And that is it for today. So to recap, just very briefly, we covered a couple different elements, superscript, subscript. We talked about divs and spans. We talked about video, audio, and iframes, as well as HRs. Tomorrow, we will pick up uh, and continue to talk about more HTML elements. We have yet to discuss tables. We have yet to discuss forms and a bunch of different inputs for forms. We also need to discuss uh, a very important topic, something called semantic markup. There is a whole subset of elements we have not covered, like navs and footers and sections and articles and dates. Those are things that we will get to. But for now, we introduced a couple new elements into our arsenal, and it's now time for a homework assignment. So as always, I hope that you do these. Um, I hope you, if you have the time, you have the willpower, uh, they're definitely worth it. You will learn a lot more by doing these uh, than just watching the videos. So in the download for this YouTube video, in the description, there's a single link you can download. It includes my code from today, as well as a homework folder. And this homework folder will include your starter text um, and some files that you'll need. So I've given you a file of text that you will need to mark up and our end result will look something like this right here. This is a instructional page about how to unstick your cat when she gets stuck to the window screen. I have dozens of videos of my cat. Uh, her name is Kitty, I never actually named her. It's um, a real point of shame for me. But anyway, ignoring her name, she gets stuck to my window screens in my house all the time, every day. Even if I trim her nails every single night, she still has claws. I don't like declawing cats. She still has the claws. I file them down. I trim them. She gets stuck all the time. And sometimes if I'm recording for a while or I'm out of the house, I feel like she gets stuck for hours at a time. I have no idea how long. Um, so I have all these videos and photos of her being stuck. And I would like for you to take the text here that I've given you. This is all the same text and turn it into this. So we've got, um, you know, larger headings, a smaller heading. Oh, a line going across the screen. How do you do that? We got a paragraph of text. There is some bolded text within the paragraph. We've got another smaller heading. Then we've got the list of instructions that is in, uh, or it's numbered, so it's ordered. Some italicized text. There are some other things I'll come back to in a moment uh, that are new that I'm actually asking you to figure out. We have some more text. We've got a link. 
Notice the link is italicized too. It's not just a regular link. It has italics or italicized text. There's an image and there's a video. So this video is me helping my cat get stuck unstuck. again? Every day, Diddy. <laughs> Every day. I'll put a compilation of this together at some point. Right. I literally have probably 50 of these videos. Sometimes she gets both claws stuck, both front claws right. at the same time. She's like supermaning into the window. Anyway, there you go. so I've included the video for you. It's called stuckkitty.mov. I've also included this image. So I'd like you to include both of those. So you'll need to make an HTML file. You'll need to write the proper skeleton. And then you'll need to take this text and add it over one piece at a time and wrap it in the correct HTML elements. But the very first thing I'd like you to do is you can see with this note at the very top, research something called entity codes. These are going to be very important uh, for this exercise at least. You've probably noticed there's a copyright symbol there. There is a up arrow here. There's a heart here. Those are not part of some font. They're not emoji or what are those? Uh, wing, wing dings, web dings. They're not some font that you download or anything like that. Instead, we generate them using something called an entity code. Um, um, that's all I'm gonna say about it because you'll learn a lot more by researching it on your own and tomorrow I'll you know, talk about what they are and how they work if you can't figure it out. Basically, you'll need to use those entity codes. You'll need to research them, look on MDN or just Google it um, to figure out how you do this copyright symbol. Notice that it is raised off the baseline. So it's not just a copyright symbol. It's in some sort of element. Then there are a few more details. This video here, um, I've written down, it should not autoplay. So when the page refreshes, it is not autoplaying. It should not be muted. So there is audio. Are you stuck again? And um, it should have a width of 500 pixels and it should have controls. As you can see, I can control this. That's all good. And then this image down here uh, is located in the same folder, kitty under bed .jpeg. I'd like you to make it 500 pixels and give it an appropriate alt text or alternate text. Otherwise, uh, make this bold, make this italicized, put the up arrow, put the heart there, um, and then make this link italicized. You can make that link go to whatever web page you want. For me, it's going to the Animal Crossing New Horizons homepage, but put it to just any valid URL, and that should be it. So you can download this code. It's not really code, but you can download this uh, starter file with the text. There are instructions embedded. So you remove this that says put copyright symbol here, remove that line, remove horizontal rule here, heart symbol here, you know, these notes. But overall, this is the main text that you'll need to mark up.